really great pleasure to welcome Nuria, Nuria Flamis here today. Um, she's coming to us from the Biomedical Research Institute in Valencia, although she's actually been in London for the last six months doing a sabbatical, ostensibly with Austin Marina at King's, who was a PhD supervisor, although she's spent quite a lot of time in the ranches now, <laughs> doing worm stuff as well. Um, so I, I, I know Maria from my postdoc at Oliver Hopert's lab at Columbia, where Maria also did her postdoc. And that's where both her and myself, but especially Nuria, became very interested in the mechanisms of neuronal specification and in particular diversification. So neural subtype specification. She's published much elegant work on this sort of idea of terminal selectors and codes of transcription factors that might regulate terminal neuronal specification. But I actually think she's going to talk to us today mostly about unpublished work. So um, specification of ciliated neurons, and more recently, she's also become interested in the evolution of neural cell types, looking at different nematodes, different nematode species. So it's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. It's really an honor to be back at UCL, and thanks Rich for the invitation. So let's get it started. Maybe uh, most of you are familiar with this analogy that says that the human brain contains as many neurons as the stars in the Milky Way. But in fact, more important than the number of neurons that we have in the brain is the great diversity of neuron types that can be found there. Because it's this exquisite specialization and functions what really allow us to fulfill our complex tasks. So in our lab, we are very interested in understanding how a single genome that is shared by all the cells in an organism can be decoded in different ways. So each neuron type, when it has to differentiate, oops, sorry, when it has to differentiate, uh, is able to scan the genome and identify the set of genes that will allow this particular neuron type to fulfill its specific functions, like, for example, ion channels, neurotransmitter receptors, enzymes for the synthesis of the neurotransmitters, etc. So how is uh, gene expression regulated? As you know, transcription factors are very important in this process. They recognize regions in the genome that are called like cancers through small and degenerate uh, regions that are uh, the DNA binding sites that bind there will recruit different uh, um, factors, including RNA polymerase and transcription stuff. So in contrast to our, our well knowledge of the genetic code, we know very little about the sequence determinants that regulate the function of enhancers. And this is a uh, great, it's an important limitation because if you consider the human genome, only 2% of the genome corresponds to coding genome. And then um, you think about mutations li linked to disease, most of them do don't lie in coding genome, they lie outside of the coding genome. But because we know very little about what are the sequence determinants that make an enhancer an enhancer, then it's very difficult to us to, uh, to assign biological meaning to this function, to these mutations. So in my lab, we want to better understand how the non-coding regulatory genome is decoded in, in the generation of different neuron types. And to address this complex question, we use a simple model organism that is C. elegans. So as you may know, C. elegans has an environmental de development that gives rise to 302 neurons in the hermaphrodite, which is much less than the, in the human brain. Uh, but already with such a small number of neurons, you can find more than 100 different neural types. And this gives you an idea of how important is neuron specification and diversification to fulfill uh, functions, even the diverse functions. Um, another um, feature of C. elegans that is very um, advantageous to us is that the non-coding regulatory genome is 50 times smaller in C. elegans compared to humans. So um, because neural diversification is a very fundamental question in biology, and because we um, we know fundamental rules in biology are phylogenetically concerned for us. Uh, C. elegans is a way of getting into these basic rules that will likely uh, allow us to better understand the development of the human brain. So, neural differentiation in C. elegans has been extensively studied, as Rich was saying, um, mainly in the laboratory of Oliver Covert and, and many others. So, when a neuron needs to differentiate, it, as I, I was say, saying, uh, it needs to express a battery of effector genes, that is what it will provide the specific functions. So the neuron needs to identify where these effector genes are coded in the genome. So like 
15 years uh, ago, Oliver Hover um, proposed that there are specific transcription factors, that is what he termed terminal selectors, that in the terminal differentiation step, they are able to find these regulatory regions corresponding to these effector genes, and then in a coordinated and direct manner, activate the expression of, of these effector genes that are the ones that characterize this uh, hypothetical neuron type. So in a different neuron type, then you will have another transcription factor that is something as a terminal selector that will be able to coordinately select a different set of effector genes. So in the last 10 years in my lab, we have been contributing to this um, model, identifying additional terminal selectors, but as Rich was saying, maybe more importantly, what we have been putting the, the focus is that terminal selectors, as any other transcription factor um, in, in any cell type, they don't work alone, they work in combination. So it's not that you have a terminal selector to select a neuron type, you have combinations of terminal selectors, what we call uh, terminal selector collectives. And this um, complex combinatorial uh, function, what we think is, is allowing to um, decode this regulatory genome and find the, the sequences that need to be activated. So the kind of question that we want to address in the lab is which kind of which transition factors control the terminal differentiation of different neurons? How do they decode the regulatory genome? If those principles and those combinations are conserved in other animal groups, and more recently, how these regulatory networks are modified in evolution to generate new neuron types. So today I'm gonna uh, tell you about two stories that are published. Uh, one is, has to do with this terminal uh, differentiation process, but not focusing on a neuron type, but focusing on an organelle that is the psyllium. And then the second story about the evolution of new, new uh, functions in, in neurons. So starting with the first story, uh, see, is, are these uh, beautiful organelle that is very ancient and can have either sensory or motile uh, functions. So it is a very complex organelle that is composed by hundreds of different proteins. Then the first, and this set of proteins is altogether what we call the cilium. So the first thing in a cell to assemble a functional cilia. What it has to do, psyllium, what it has to do is to identify these genes in the, in the genome and activate the transcription. So because this, uh, because the cilia is present in many different cell types and has many different functions, it's not surprising that mutations in some of these components are linked to pathologies. That is why they all together are called ciliopathies. And because they have very pleiotropic functions, they, the ciliopathies have also very pleiotropic uh, um, symptoms, as you can see here. So, as I was telling you, um, mutations in some of these psyllium components are linked to ciliopathies, but then you have many other ciliopathies that are assigned by the phenotype they have, but there is no clear mutation that has been assigned to them. And what we think is that maybe uh, the genetic component in these uh, pathologies is due to mutation in the non coding genome that is controlling the expression of some of these psyllium components. So then it's really important to understand how the transcriptional regulation of the psyllium is coordinately regulated. So what do we know about, about this? So we know there is a family of transcription factors, that is the family of the RFX transcription factors, which act as terminal selectors for the psyllium. They can identify the regulatory regions of the psyllium and coordinate the activate transcription. And this role is very well conserved in evolution, so it can be found in C elegans uh, up to humans. Indeed, this uh, role for RFX transcription factor was first identified in C elegans in a seminal paper from Peter Svoboda that identified DAF19, that is the only RFX transcription factor in the uh, C elegans genome as a terminal selector. So, how is the cilium or the cilia system in C elegans? So, C elegans does not have motile cilia, they only contain. Um, sensory cilia and is present in some neurons that are the sensory ciliated neurons. So here you have an schema of different neurons in C elegans that are the, the ones that have a cilia for the sensory functions. Each of these 118 neurons in C elegans has its own name and, and here you can see it with the three letters that characterize each neuron type. So these are all ciliated neurons. And then at the end of the dendrite, they have um, this beautiful cilia that can have a very diverse morphologies as you have here. So we know 
uh, since 2000 that DAC 19 is a terminal selector for these genes, but uh, we were quite sure that DAC 19 cannot be the only transcription factor working uh, in the selection of the cilio. One, because we are quite obsessed with the idea that transcription factors work in combinations, but also uh, because of this uh, very uh, simple result. So here you have a picture of a transgenic worm that is expressing a reporter for one of these cilium components. It's IFT20, it doesn't matter, it's a, a, um, an intraflagellar transport protein in the wild type. We know this gene is directly related by DAF19. So in the DAF19 mutant, you, you can see a great decrease in, in the expression of this gene. But if you realize that this is still some remaining expression in the sedated neurons, so that was telling us that other transcription factor is still regulating the expression of those genes. So then Rebecca Brocal, a PhD student in, in the lab, addressed this question in her project. So how did we start the project? We took a combination of bioinformatic approach to try to get um, to a candidate for working together with DAF-19. So DAF-19, the RFX, binds to the genome to <clears throat> particular binding site. That is what is called the X boxes that are quite um, big. And this leaves a signature in the cilium genes that can, that can be defined because they have the presence of this X box. So what we reason is that maybe this other hypothetical transcription factor might also be leaving a signature associated to the regulatory regions of the cilium. So to try to get these additional motifs, what we did is we built a um, list of 163 genes that are our cilium gene list. And then we look for enrichment on, on transcription factor binding sites. And we did uh, uh, identify the Xbox as expected, but then unfortunately we didn't have any clear match for uh, any particular transcription factor or transcription factor family. So okay. then we took an alternative approach. We, got, um, we started to look for a transcription factor that was enriched in its expression in all the sedated sensory neurons. So, uh, and we used uh, single cell data for that, that we have a transcription for all the different cell types. So when we did that, we found a list of 10 different transcription factors that are enriched in the ciliated sensory neurons compared to the expression in all other neuron types or, or non-neurons in CLRs. This is telling us that the transcription factors are enriched in ciliated neurons, but then we, to, to make the list shorter, we said, okay, from this 10 transcription factor, is there any that is expressed, not just enriched in ciliated uh, sensory neurons, but it's expressed in all the ciliated sensory neurons because all have cilia. And then from then we went to our favorite candidate that is for today, because we could see here you have a picture of again the IFT printed to label all the ciliated sensory neurons. And what we saw is that this transcription factor indeed is expressed in all in all the ciliated sensory neurons. Okay. And then finally to combine the bioinformatic analysis, what we did is we took advantage of the modern code data that has transcription factor uh, binding profiles in the genome for more than 200, it, when we did the, um, this analysis, uh, there were data for 259 transcription factors from um, out of the around 900 that are in the, in the CLR genome, and one of them was uh, forehead eight. So what we did is we got all these um, binding profiles, and we and, and we check for all these 259 transcription factors. The amount of binding what, that we could see for each of them in the cilium, in these 163 genes of the cilium. And what we saw is that there was, among all the transition factors, there was a variable bind number of, of peaks found associated to the cilium. But there was a clear out, uh, out layer here, and, and we were very reassured to see that forehead is, so it behaves very differently and really likes to bind nearby the cilium genes. Uh, of course, you might think maybe it's because forehead aid is binding very extensively in the genome, including the cilium genes. So what we did is we plotted the number of to total peaks for each of these uh, data sets compared to the binding set that were associated to the cilium. And what you can see is that still forehead aid compared, co um, behaves very different to the rest of the, of the transcription factors that we analyzed. So we had this candidate forehead aid as a regulator, direct regulator of the cilium, the question is, it's really required for the expression. So for that, we use two different alleles for forehead 
One uh, Venetian Aline, the TM292, that was available when we started the project. But then we were not sure if gonna, it was going to be behave as a null because the deletion doesn't remove the, the DNA binding domain. So we built ourselves a full deletion of the locus. And then there is the, the idea is okay, if Forgerate is so important, it's working with DAF19 to, to activate the transcription of the cilium, then the mutant should have defects in the cilium expression. So to check that in C11, it's very common to use transgenics because they are really easy to do. So what you do is you just take the regulatory reasons that you want to analyze and clone them in front of GFP and do transgenics. And we did that. Uh, so here you have some examples for the expression of different three different components of the cilium, which are in the wild type widely expressed in the head, in the sensory related neurons. And then when we check the expression in, in forgery mutants, what we saw is that indeed there is a reduction in the expression of these reporters, which was suggesting that it's not only that forgery binds to the regulatory uh, regions of the cilium, but it's also required for the expression. But of course, this is in a quite artificial uh, context, if you may, because it's, you take a piece of DNA and you put it outside of the chromosome in, in front of the GFP. So to make sure that really, uh, for today was controlling the expression of the cilium. We did a different strain in which we endogenously tag one of these cilia components, OSPOMIS5. Uh, so here you see in the wild type expression as expected in the ciliated sensory neurons in the head. And again, now with for today mutant, there is a big decrease in the expression of the cilium component. And this is endogenous expression. So it seems that um, it really is required for cilium expression. It is already known that mutants for the cilium components, they show defects in the morphology of the cilia because they are also required for the morphology of, of the cilia. So the next thing that we did is to analyze for some of these uh, neurons if the cilia in the forehead a mutant was affected. And what we saw is that there are slight but significant defects in the morphology of some of these cilia. As you can see here, for example, the steps are uh, shorter or uh, the AIY seems to be the branch. So finally, so we have if Forgeta is required for cilium expression, for cilia morphology, and ciliated sensory neurons in C elements, they are involved in a specific, in sensing a specific stimuli in the environment, and they have been very well studied. So um, we have different paradigms that we know they are mediated by a specific neurons. So for example, one, um, so AWC neuron is responsible for mediating the attraction of C elements to, to heptanone, and then repulsion to two non-anone is sensed by a different neuron that is AWG. So you can do different behaviors and that if, if they are affected, they will tell you the functionality of the neurons that are affected. So we did that with different uh, different paradigms. And what we saw here, for example, olfaction to as I was telling you, to optanone or to non-anone, mechanosensory responses, uh, no, no stats, for example, or good that gustatory responses to SDS or copper. And what we could see is that, in particular for the phosphorylated non-mutant allele, there were defects in the display of these sensory functions. So in summary, it, it really seems that phosphorylated is acting also as a terminal selector for the cilium. It affects um, gene expression, Morphology and behavior. Yes. How does the double look like? Or how do the phenotypes of the DAF19 mutants compare? Yes. So I don't have it here because I I I, I didn't have time to, to show it. But um, so DAF19 phenotype is much stronger than Forgeta, but still you have this remaining expression. So we did the double to see if we could see synergy, and in for different uh, reporters. That's the case, but then um, it's difficult. So if you have like, let's say, some neurons are gone in one, some neurons are gone in the other, and then in the in the double you have more neurons that are gone. You don't know if that's additivity of different populations of neurons, or it's really synergistic effect. So we are now doing experiments to try to really identify the remaining cells. So we have now a very nice example. I think it's in. IL2 neurons, which is one particular report that I forgot the name, is maintained in Daphne mutant, is maintained in Forgerate mutant, and in the level is gone from those particular neurons. So we have some examples 
of synergistic effect, which I think is very nice. And so, do you know whether that 19 binding is impacted by your? Um, no, we that or that vice versa. We haven't done those experiments, but I would be nice. Or if, if they, so we have started trying to see if they physically interact, uh, but we have no results yet. So, um, one thing that I yes. can I just ask a question? So I think it's relevant to what yeah, yeah, for saying. sure. And um, in these mutants, are you changing the identity of the neurons to a different neuron, or are they the same neuron but like micellar? Yes. Yeah, so, so basically, with this terminal selector concept, it will be like parallel routines. Uh, imagine two ciliated neurons. This one has receptors for one particular other, and this one has receptors for another other. So DAF19 or port head 8 will not affect the subtype identity. So those receptors, even if they have to be located in the cilium, are, the, the expression is not affected by the structural cilia that is shared by all the ciliated neurons is affected. So it, it, they run like in parallel. And then you have the terminal selector in that cell that will regulate many features, including the, the receptors on the, in the cilia. Can I follow up on this question from Mark? So, do you know how does the expression of that 19 evolving when you look to all you when you look in a particular image? I mean, do you know, you know, are they only really required as terminal selectors or might they have so functions earlier in the image? So, forehead A, we have checked forehead A in a civil development yeah. and it, it correlates with, so it's not expressed very early, it correlates with neurogenesis when the, these neurons are born. We don't know exactly if it's like a terminal just in the last differentiation, but, but you see you see it just more or less around the time that you start to, to, to generate these neurons. DAF19 is different because DAF19 expression, is, DAF19 is expressed in all neurons in CLMs, but the difference is the isoforms. So you have an isoform that is only expressed in ciliated neurons, and then another different isoform that are expressed in the rest of the neurons. And one thing that we know is that in DAF19 mutants, forehead aid expression gets derepressed in non ciliated neurons. So the, it's a bit complicated, but the, the isoforms that are not ciliated repress forehead aid in non ciliated neurons, which I find also very interesting. So if you see synergies, it might not really be at the level exactly of one gene and its expression. It could also be happening earlier. And what can we can talk when we okay? What we know is in the ciliated neurons, they don't the expression of them, they don't depend on each other. So the mutant DAF19 is expressed in ciliated neurons and for heavy mutant and vice versa. It's affected in the non-ciliated neurons. And yes, we can talk. Um more if you want later. So um, I briefly mentioned that there are two kinds of cells that have cilia. The ones that have a sensory cilia, like in CLMs, we only have that one. And then in vertebrates, we also have cilia that has motile functions. Um, and they tell, um, so our effects, transcription factors are required, are terminal selectors for the cilia in both types of cells that have cilia, but then in vertebrates, it's known that cell types that have motile cilia, they have an additional transition factor that is FOCJ1, that is a transition factor from the forehead family, which acts together with RFX. So when we when, when we identify for, for today as a regulated or of, of cilium in sensory stimulated cells, then we thought if FOCJ1 could be uh, able to rescue the phenotype of forehead aid, in, in, in C elements. So for that, we did this series of experiments in which we do transgenic animals that using, so we use this promoter that is expressed in a subpopulation of ciliated cells in C elements. And this promoter, it's, it's, it's related to dopamine synthesis. So it's not affected by forehead a mutant. And then we express the cDNA um, and, and GFP to, to have a control of expression. So this is a wild type worm. The wild type worm expresses IFT20 um, in the in these uh, neurons because they are ciliated. In a forehead a mutant, um, 
without the expression of any cDNA, the expression of IFT20 in these cells is gone, as we would expect, because it's part of the cilium. And then uh, this um, defect in expression can be rescued if you introduce back the cDNA of Forgeray, which is what you also would expect, and it's telling you that Forgeray is acting cell autonomously in those cells. But the nice thing is that we could also rescue the, the expression defect for IFT20 when we introduce not for headache, but the FOXA1 from the mouse. And this was telling us that the, 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 the regulation of the serum was conserved, the function was conserved between for headache and FOXA1. So there is a, an additional for head transcription factor that in Xenopus has been related to uh, cilium expression that is FOXA1. And we did similar experiments, and this is. Transcription factor is also able to rescue the forehead phenotype. Uh, we, but it's not that any forehead will uh, have this ciliogenic uh, potential because we have just additional subfamilies of forehead, FOXI1, that is not, it has no known role in ciliogenesis, and, and this transcription factor was not able to rescue the phenotype. So with these results, we we have a working hypothesis. So we speculate something about the ancient regulation of, of the cilium. So um, in the last common eukaryotic ancestor, it's supposed that it, it already contained a cilia and that this cilia had mixed functions, sensory and motile. And, and it's already quite strongly suggested that IFX was already uh, involved in cilium, uh, indirect cilium regulation very anciently. And what we think is that maybe Porcheri was already also part of this regulatory logic, and then when the multicellularity arrives, it also came with the specialization of cilia into motile cilia, cells that have motile cilia, and cells that have sensory cilia. So the ones that had motile cilia, maybe they took, Foxy1 took the, the, the role of controlling the cilium in these cells, while additional forehead transcription factor might have sustained this ability, but for the sensory cilia uh, cells. Then this will end up in the vertebrates with FOX A1 and FOX M4 um, as controlling the, the motor cilia in, in vertebrate cells. In C elements, where we see for, for head A working with the flying team. And then the, if this is correct, then maybe additional forehead transcription factors in vertebrates are having the same uh, role as the regulator of the cilium in sensory activated cells. And this is something that we are now exploring more in, in the lab, but we have no idea which members are. So this is it for, for the first part of the of the story, uh, or the, for the first story. And then now I'm going to tell you about a different project that is also unpublished in, in the lab that is about evolution of new neuron types. So because CLN has this very simple nervous system, and because we think we know quite a lot about how it's uh, differentiated, then we thought that it might be a very good system to try to understand how you change these uh, regulatory networks to create new neuron types. And this is also uh, an effort uh, for two PhD students, Carlos Mora and Andrea Millan. So in this project, we have been studying different species of penartitis. You have here C. elegans, and we focus on studying the serotonergic system. And we focus on the serotonergic system for a very simple and practical reason is that the antibody against serotonin works very well, so you can use it in any species. And, and what we did, so we did an extensive study of how the serotonergic system looks in these different species, in, in, in several of these species. Um, and most of the staining was quite uh, conserved. <coughs> Here you have an schema of the region of the galva with two neurons in both sides that are the HSNs, which in C. elegans is very known, they are serotonergic. And we saw the same for most of the species that we studied. But then we made a an, um, nice observation is that near the vulva in the anterior and posterior region for this group of species that are the Angaria group, we saw a staining for serotonin in all of them. And we didn't see this staining in any of the other species that we studied. And because the C. elegans nervous system is so well uh, known, we knew here there were in C. elegans two neurons that is what they are called BC4 and BC5. So the idea is that BC4 and BC5 that in C. elegans are cholinergic motor neurons in this group of species has acquired the ability to 
staying for serotonin. So this was, and, and this was reported already for uh, Siangaria in a paper in 2007. So the project was to try to understand what happened at the regulatory um, level to convert these neurons that were polynetic in C. elegans to um, serotonergic in Angaria. So um, what makes a serotonergic neuron able to synthesize serotonin? It needs to express this battery of enzymes and transporters. That is what we call the serotonin pathway genes. So what we thought is that in the Angaria group, there has been the acquisition of the expression of these genes in BC4 and BC5. So there are two ways in which you can imagine how this could happen. On one hand, um, you could think that the important driver was changes in the trans environment. What I mean by that is that you could imagine an ancient cell that in the BC4 and BC5 are not serotonergic, so this cell doesn't have the transcription factors that are required to activate the expression of these genes. And this is the same in C elegans. But now in, in the Angaria group, these two neurons start to express a transcription factor that now it expresses or activates the expression of the serotonin pathway gene. So you see the staining. But then you could also think alternatively that the important is not the transcription factors that change in the cell, but the regulatory regions of the genes. So here you will have an ancestral cell that doesn't have BC4 and BC5 serotonergic. It does have a, a very important transcription factor, but the serotonin pathway genes are blind to it. And this is the same in C elements, but now in the Angaria group, these uh, serotonin pathway genes might acquire an enhancer that is activated by this transcription factor, and now you, you get the phenotype. So the good thing about this model is that they make specific predictions of what will happen if you do transgenesis of um, the regulatory regions of both genomes and put it in one species and the other. So when the trans environment is important, the transcription factors in the cell, then it doesn't matter where you are getting the regulatory regions from, the important is where you put it. So in the Angaria species, you always have the transcription factors. So if you put the regulatory regions of the serotonin pathways in this there, they will be activated and they will see GFP, but not the other way around. If you take out this uh, weather regions of the serotonin pathway in Mangaria and you put it in a different context, you don't have the transcription factors, you don't get activation. But on the contrary, if the thesis is important, then is the, the the information is in there. So if you get the serotonin pathway in the weather region and you put it in C elegance, it will get activated. So to test this, we did this transgenesis, and just to make a long story short, we saw. Two important things. One is that this gene that is the vesicular monamine transporter, that is the one that is required for loading the vesicles with serotonin, this gene is already expressed in C. elegans. And this is quite mysterious because I told you BC4 and BC5 are cholinergic neurons. So nobody really knows why a cholinergic neuron is using this uh, gene, but it's there. That was already known. And then what we saw is that for the mod 5 expression, it seems that the this environment is um, what happened. What I mean by that is we could get the regulatory region of the mod 5, that is the serotonin reuptaker, from Angaria and put it in C elegans. And then you see that this um, is able to be activated in, in C elegans, BC4 and BC5. But when you take the mod 5 regulatory region from elegans and put it in C Angaria, it is not activated. So it seems that the important information is in the regulatory region and not in the trans environment. So basically, C. elegans mod 5 uh, enhancer is not active in C. elegans. C. angaria mod 5 enhancer is active in, in C. elegans, which is for a fixed five. Then you would expect that also the enhancers for mod 5 all of, of all these other species would also be activated in C. elegans. So when we were doing this project, we got um, access to two genomes from the Angaria group, Kiopensis and Castelli, and we did uh, transgenesis in C. elegans, and we, say, we saw the same, that uh, enhancer for mod 5 from Kiopensis genome and Castelli genome are activated in C. elegans, BC4 and BC5. One important thing that I have to tell you is that this enhancer is located in the intron 1 of the gene here, right? And this is already an enhancer in C. elegans. So, this enhancer is active 
in serotonergic neurons that are not the VC4 and VC5. And what has happened is that now uh, VC4 and VC5 activates this enhancer only when it's coming from the Angaria species, the ones that have VC4 and VC5 serotonergic, but not the one in CLL. So that's why what we think is happening is not that you are creating a de novo enhancer, but you have co-opted an enhancer that was already active in different tissues, different neurons, to be active in the VC4 and VC5 in Angaria. Okay, but this is about, so I told you CAT1 is stressed in CLL, MOD5 is the one that has acquired the expression. Uh, but then you have all these enzymes to produce serotonin. What happened with that? So what I didn't tell you is that there are two kinds of serotonergic neurons. One are the serotonergic producers, that they need the full set of genes. But then we have a second type of serotonergic neurons that are the reuptakers. And these kind of neurons, they don't synthesize serotonin. They take it from the environment and pack it and then use it as a neurotransmitter. And the second type of uh, serotonergic neurons, they only need two, type, two, two genes for that. CAT1, that we know is expressed already in CLR, and then MOD5, that is the one that we have seen, has acquired the ability of being expressed in music for and So then what we think is happening is that uh, in Angaria species, VC4 and VC5 takes the serotonin from the HSN that is a producer and is very near, and then that's why they stay for serotonin. So if this is the case, then the prediction would be that if you laser ablate the HSN, so you kill the source, and then the staining from the VC4 and VC5 should be gone. So to do these experiments, Carla Lloret, who when they still was a PhD student in my lab, came to Arantxa's lab to do these experiments, and then indeed what we saw is that yes, if you kill the HSN in Angaria, then you remove the, the staining for serotonin in this cells. Like here you have the quantification. To further validate the model, what we did is we built a um, mutant for MOD5 in Angaria, which was a bit challenging, but uh, we managed to, to, to do it uh, because Angaria is not a model organism. Uh, so, but anyway, um, MOD5 mutants, which now they don't have the serotonin reuptaker, what, they, what you can see is that they lose the staining for serotonin in DC4 and DC5 compared to the wild type. Again, supporting this idea that VC4 and VC5 in this uh, group of species has converted into um, serotonin reuptakers. Okay, so this is the model. And then what happens in CLRs is that VC4 uh, and VC5 express CAT1, but because they don't have the reuptaker, they don't stain for serotonin. Then the prediction would be if you now express MOD5 in CLRs, then that should be enough to provide the serotonergic staining in these two cells. So we tested that, and that's the case. So <clears throat> this is the wild type, not the same for serotonin in VC4 and VC5. But if you express MOS5 and there are promoters that is specific for VC4 and VC5, then you, that's sufficient to provide the serotonin stain. Okay. So who, which one is the transition factor that is now activating MOS5 and cancer from the Angaria species? So I told you we know quite a lot about transcription factors and neurons in CLA. So we knew already there is one transcription factor that is called AMP4 and ANX transcription factor, and neuron factor, that is considered to be the terminal selector for this neuron. So the idea was, could it be that the terminal selector for VC4 and VC5 in CLA is now able to activate as well the enhancer for uh, MOD5 of, of the Angaria species? So for that, what we did is just put this uh, reporter into the AMP4 mutant. And yes, what we saw is that if you don't have AMP4, then you are uh, C elegans, VC4 and VC5, cannot activate the expression in, in these neurons. And then we did some promoter analysis, some bashing and some direct mutagenesis until we have really identified the particular binding site that is bound uh, by AMP4 to activate the expression here. Okay, so. Uh, I've been telling you how a group of species have changed um, their phenotype, the serotonergic phenotype, because now they have acquired an enhancer that is active in these cells that was not in, in other species. But then the question is, okay, but does it have any functional relevance uh, in the behavior of, of the worms? So VC4 and VC5, I told you, they are cholinergic motor neurons, 
and they are involved in the egg laying behavior. So, see how C. elegans lays the eggs is that the, it, see, this has been also very well studied, and the circuit it's in HSM neurons are also involved. And basically, the world transitions between inactive phases where no eggs are uh, laid, and then active phases in which the worm lays a different number of eggs. It can be one, it can be seven. So you can plot these time intervals. So these, sorry, these lines are egg laying events. So if you plot uh, these intervals, then you can, well, you can see this is the length of the intervals, and this is the accumulated uh, frequency. So what you can see is that you have all these very frequent short intervals that will correspond to these ones. And then the long inactive intervals, etc. And this is already been studied for many years now. <clears throat> so, how about egg laying in Hungaria? Nobody has checked egg laying before in Hungaria. Of course, uh, very few work has been done in Hungaria. So, again, we came back to Baranza. I came here in the summer, officially in Kings, but most of my time here. And we have been setting up uh, movies to study. Angaria egg laying. And what we have seen is that it seems that Angaria lays eggs quite differently. It doesn't have these active windows. It lays eggs just one at a time, which is interesting, but it is not telling us much about the role of DC4 and DC5 serotonergic phenotype in egg laying because these are two different species with many, many differences. So, what we did is now compare what we can compare. So, we use C elegans. But now compare it to the C elegans in which we have expressed mod five in BC4 and BC5. So the, these two neurons <coughs> stay for serotonin. And then compare the egg laying of Hungaria, but now compare it to the Hungarian mutant that doesn't have staining for serotonin in BC4 and BC5. So when we did that, what we found is that in C elegans, just by expressing mod five serotonin reuptaker um, in BC4 and BC5, this is sufficient to shift the time of the inactive interval. So basically, in C elegans, uh, the worm takes longer to enter in an active phase of egg laying. And now we did the same, but with these two um, different uh, models. And what we saw is exactly the contrary that when you have, when Angaria uh, doesn't have the serotonin reuptaker, then you have a shift in the long intervals and they are shorter. So they lay eggs more frequently. So we can say that modifying the serotonin phenotype of these two neurons modify their behavior. We cannot, or at least I cannot even speculate what is the meaning of that in nature because we know very little about how these species, where they live, how they live, if, if this way of putting X is gonna be more or less adaptive. But I think it's not nice that at least we can, we can see a, a behavioral difference. So just uh, to sum up, Using different species of gangarditis, we were able to identify a new function or a new phenotype. And then what we have find out is that this phenotype is due to the co-option of one enhancer to these particular neuron types. And this co-option has been through uh, the terminal selector that has now um, increased the targets, you now includes MOD5 as well. And this leads to uh, the, the staining of serotonin of the VC4 and VC5. And changes and changes in uh, egg laying behavior. So with that, I finish by thanking the people in the lab. Uh, special thanks to Arancha here. It's a lot of fun to work with her. And uh, Peter Svoboda from the Karolinska that is also involved in the first part of the talk. Thank you for coming, and I'll be happy to take questions. Mark? Yeah, I was just wondering the, the VC for neurons that gain serotonin, serotonergic, mm -hmm. so do they lose cholinergic? Yeah, we haven't checked that. I need to. So the, the good thing is uh, there are antibodies for, for the, I think, the big chart that were done in, in Sierra and I need to ask for that and for the VMAT as well. At least an antibody we have to check that. Wait, but, but not necessarily because indeed HSN, the one that is serotonin producer, it's both cholinergic and serotonergic. So it will not be weird that it's both, but uh, we don't know. Yes. 
Yeah, um, related to that. So, what is the what, what would or how would the serotonergic uptake relate to the the mechanical behavior? Is it is it acting as a sink? Or... Yeah, that's a very good question, and we also don't know. So, one hypothesis is where you exactly what you were saying that indeed uh, VC4 and VC5 do not really use it as a neurotransmitter to signal. So, yeah, so they don't use it as a neurotransmitter to signal, but they, it's just like a strategy to remove very fast the serotonin from the environment, from the muscle to, to get the contraction. Another one would be that they they do use it and, and liberate the, but we haven't done any of that yet. See? I would have expected um, when you look between similar cell types that use um, uh, many similar genes that uh, it, to distinguish between those two, I would have imagined that in addition to activating cell type specific, subtype specific genes in one and not the other, you would have um, mechanisms to silence those same loci. That is, that there would be for every transcription you activate that you would have a mechanism to silence in the the, the same locus in the in the other side. And, and I wondered if you had, if that's the case, whether it's just simply the absence of an activator, transcriptional activator, or whether there is complementary uh, transcriptional silencing of those loci. So, for most of the work. But we have been doing um, taking the expression of any concepts and chopping it down. For me, it was quite striking what you said that there there didn't seem to be pieces that were acting as repressors. But then it might be that you have both the activity of repressing and activity in the same enhancer, so you cannot just physically separate. It. And then later work from other people in Oliver's lab, they have shown indeed the case. That you have it, this would be not so much for uh, different neuron types, but in a similar neuron types like subtypes, that you also have repressors to to make this uh, diversification further um, refined. For the kind of for the, for the serotonergic um, logic that we have been working quite in the lab, indeed we found a specific enhancer modules. That were driving the expression in different neuron subtypes. We have imagine three different neurons uh, that are serotonergic, NSM, HSN, or ADF. So each of these serotonin pathway gene is regulated by through different modules, and those modules receive the input from the terminal selectors in each neuron type. So it, it might depend on how similar the, the, the cells are that you rely more on repression or on activation. I guess on that, like another way of framing it would be that I mean the VC4, VC5 identity isn't changed, right? So the sort of but they are still the same identity effectively. And so the, the upstream sort of uh, self amplification repression type thing that you would usually use to establish identity uh, is probably unchanged. It's just that now uh, one other gene effectively has been co opted to be one of the like mechanistic expression genes of, of that identity, right? So and in that case, I think it, it would make sense to not expect that on that level the repression would, would, would kick into action. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, these are species that are quite long diverged and molecularly quite different. So we really don't know how much different. Right, so right. at the same time that you gain targets, you might, you might be losing targets. So the one project that we are doing in the lab is now using single cell technology, which you have can profile the different cells, but not in CLLs, in Nigeria or in Brixi. And now we will have this, this like doing serotonin staining, but brutally, because you have the transcriptome for everything. So hopefully we will work and then we will, we will have a more general overview of what's going on. I think that's the end there. People outside, but uh, Nuri no, is still around, but people have further questions. Okay, it's up to